staff well-being, apologies if you were here for the panel, because you're kind of going to get my spiel of who I am and what I'm, I'm about, um, and I suppose why I'm this side of the chairs rather than that side of the chairs. Um, so I'm head teacher at Ayers Monsell Primary School. Um, I love it when we come down south past Watford Gap, because then it's Ayers Monsell. No, we're Ayers Monsell. So, um, I've been at the school for six years, and um, about three years ago now, we uh, absolutely wanted to change the culture of our school, because it just wasn't working. Um, and we very much looked at mental health and well-being, and that is the underpinning driver now for our school. It underpins our curriculum, it underpins our ethos. It's what we're about if you walk through the door. Um, we are a gold status for the School Mental Health Award. That's through Leeds Beckett University and the Carnegie Centre of Excellence. And we were actually the first school in the country to get that award. Um, we're gold for SMSC. We are also the only primary school to have the Princess Royal Training Award, which is specifically around what we're going to talk about this afternoon. So that was around the impact of our staff training on mental health. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so they were the aims of the sessions. Um, if you actually have already looked and that's why you're in the room, we're going to go on really quickly because we don't have time. Um, why do we need to think about staff well-being? Um, because we're all really, really stressed and frustrated and have too much to do, not enough time to do it. So it's actually, as a profession now, um, causing us to have physical, psychological and emotional symptoms um, because of the culture, the systems, the changes that take place. So these are some up-to-date national statistics. These are from Education Support Partnerships Teacher um, Wellbeing Index. And you can literally Google it and get the whole document. But as you can see just from this statistics, it's suggesting that as a profession, something isn't right. We're trying to do the best that we can, but we're becoming more stressed. We're experiencing physical symptoms to the point that some staff now are having to take periods of absence, periods of time off. Um, and more and more, we're now starting to see that people in the education system, particularly teachers, are now displaying mental health systems, anxiety, depression, and for nearly half of teachers, they feel that the culture within their school is something that's causing that negative effect on their mental health. So we have to do something about it, because if we don't, next year all of these figures are going to be even higher, and that becomes a problem. Um, so in two th academic year 2016, um, I had 151 days of absence in my school related to mental health issues. So 151 days, teachers weren't in the building teaching the children because of mental health, stress, anxiety, depression. And for me, there was obviously the, the my staff, I need to look after them. But as a school leader, if there's any school leaders in the room, head teachers, principals, that was costing me £22,000 a year in supply money. Because every time somebody's away, if I can't cover it internally, I have to pay. So £22,000 a year for my school budget was being spent just on cover for staff absent through mental health. So we said, well, we need to do something about it then. So we started looking into mental health a bit more, a lot of the documentation, a lot of the research. And if you're going to try and impact staff mental health and staff well-being, the first thing we have to do is have a common language in our school for what mental health is. Because there's no point us all talking about different things. So in my school, and um, the, the kind of definition that for us is the most friendly is actually from the World Health Organization. And that's what they define mental health as. 
And I think if anybody reads that, you kind of go, yeah. I just want to be able to cope productively, fruitfully with life. Life has ups and downs. Things go well, things don't go well, but I want to be able to cope with that. That to me is about having good mental health. So when we think of mental well-being and what staff well-being therefore is, again, we need to have that tangible, what will it look like? It's fine for me to go, we're all going to have marvelous well-being in my school. But actually, when I say that, what am I wanting to see from the adults that walk down my corridors, from the parents who come in the building? So we started looking at what to us is well-being about. If I wanted to say my staff had good well-being, what would I see in their actions and their behaviours? What would they do? And these are the things that to us, if we have good mental health and good well-being, these are the things that we'll see in our staff. So consequently, if we aren't seeing these things, then it means my staff are struggling with something and I'm not getting something right. Because ultimately, my staff are my first port of call. They're the people who go into classrooms and do the job. They're the people I have to look after. Because without my staff, I don't have a school. Because there's nobody there to teach the children and to move things forward. So absolutely for me, um, it has to start with the staff. So, as I said earlier, stress now is becoming a big issue in terms of mental health and well-being. We know, as we said, the education sector is now the most stressed profession. But stress sometimes is just banded about, of, oh, no, I didn't do that because I'm stressed. I didn't do that because I'm stressed. And actually... We tended just to see literally anything could suddenly become stressful or a stress situation. And stress almost being this negative word. But actually, low-level stress for a small period of time can be helpful. It helps us to concentrate. It helps us to have a sense of urgency with the actions we're doing. So stress isn't a negative it's a negative when that stress becomes too high for too long a period. But in terms of staff well-being, rather than sitting there and trying to think of every single nuance, task, facet that might cause stress, it's actually easier as a school leader or for you in your role within the school to actually think, well, what areas of this are causing me stress? Am I somebody that really stresses about time? I don't have enough time. I don't plan. I don't prioritize. I don't use a calendar. So actually, time stress is my big issue. Whereas somebody else, for them, it might actually be relationships with people or those encounter stresses that actually could make them frustrated. So, for example, the NQT in your school, who's worrying because she's got to do parents' evening for the first time, and she's never had to do that before. Or somebody that's worrying about the dynamic of a relationship between two colleagues that isn't working, and you worry when you're having to work with that person, could be an example of things like that. Um, for me, situational stress is mine. Um, I'm quite a control freak. So if I know it's... He's nodding. You can tell who works with me. He's going, yeah, she is. Um, for me, if I know it's coming, it's planned for. I've got it sorted, not a problem. But when your laptop breaks the day before you're doing a presentation at the education show and wipes all your files, I am suddenly, incredibly, situationally stressed. So I can't see it. I didn't know it's coming, but I'm going, I'm really stressed. So when you're back in school or for yourself, which area of these actually do you look at and go, do you know what, that's me, that's where I get stressed? Because if you know what causes you stress, you personally can do something about it. 
but also me as a leader in your school, if I know half of my staff are worried about time stress, then I can make sure I have a whole school calendar at the start of the year when every staff meeting is, every parents' evening is, every date for a day to drop, so that I can help you manage that stress. I can try and look at workload to help reduce those things. I can do role play. So if you're stressing about Ofsted might be coming through the door, well, actually, I can do some role play with you to try and reduce the anxiety around that. So if you're looking at action planning for well-being for your staff, think of it in terms of these four areas. Um, and I'm doing, as I said earlier, I'm doing a master's at the minute um, of leadership of mental health in schools. So if you are a bit of a kind of research geek, um, go and have a look at Albrecht. Um, and there's even more information. You've got a sheet about that to take away as well. So when I was asked to talk about staff well-being, um, what I like to do is try and have people leave with at least one idea that you take away with you. So long as you walk away with something, I'm kind of okay with that. It's the people that walk away and go, well, that was a load of rubbish. I'm kind of like, didn't do my job well. So when I was thinking as a leader and everything that we've done to improve uh, the culture of staff mental health and well-being in our school, these are some of the kind of top tips that as a leader you can think about. And again, there is a handout on this to take home. So when we're talking about creating that positive culture, it's little things as a leader. What are the interactions that you have with your staff? Do you say thank you? Do you make chit chat with them about what they did at the weekend? Um, do you actually make that culture that's friendly, that's open? If somebody has a problem, they can come and talk to you and that's okay. So what does the actual culture in your school look like? Can we reduce stigma around mental health so that it isn't this scary thing that I can't tell anybody I'm feeling stressed or actually I suffer from depression? Because if I know those things, I can support you. I can put things in place. The connected staff is really important. There's been a lot of work done by a lady called Emma Sapala, um, who works out of Stamford Centre. And when we think about mental health, as a teacher, and I do remember those days, I know I've been in education for 20 years and I'm now a head teacher, so people go, you're not a proper teacher anymore. I do still remember the days and I do still teach year six. Um, connectivity is vital. I remember as a teacher, I'd come in, I'd go to my classroom, I'd prepare my lessons, I'd teach, I'd get to lunchtime and I'd mark in my classroom. I'd then teach again in the afternoon. I'd then stay behind and tidy it all up and prepare for the next day. So I never actually left the classroom. I didn't connect with people. I didn't go and talk to colleagues. I didn't go and get a cup of tea in the staff room. And that isolation is really bad for our mental health because we need other people. We need to talk. We need to connect. So connection for us has been a big thing. Um, are there any head teachers in the room? Oh, yay! Love it. My staff have extra time out of class. Sorry. Um, every Thursday for an hour, all my teaching assistants come out of class. Teachers manage on their own because you're more than capable of doing that. Um, every Friday afternoon, my teachers come out of class and we have collaborative learning time. That's in addition to staff meetings and inset. Every week, my staff are coming out as a professional group and having additional learning about their jobs, their roles. What can we do to move the school forwards? Because it makes different connections for people. We get time with people that usually, key stage two, all do not mix with foundation stage. It's a whole different world in foundation stage. But actually, no. Because foundation stage has got real impact for what we could be doing in other areas of school. So why can't we actually talk together? So that connectivity is really important. In terms
terms of developing this whole school staff, it's just being mindful of what would I want somebody to do for me? I'd want somebody to ask me if Adam was in a bad mood. I'd want someone to kind of remember it was my birthday and give me a birthday card. Or if they thought I'd done a good job, I'd want them to come and tell me. It's not rocket science, it's just being a nice person. So actually, for my staff, if I go into your room, uh, and when I go and see you for a lesson observation, I give you a little postcard that says, thank you for letting me come to your room. Because it's your classroom. It's a privilege for me to come to your room because that's your workspace. So before I go into what was good, what we need to develop, just actually thank you for letting me come. So all of those ideas are things that you can do. But we can't just put those in without some degree of training. And it's really important that when you're trying to embed a culture of well-being, it has to start with your staff. Because although I'm the leader, I'm the head, I'm passionate about mental health and well-being, if I can't get everybody else in my school as passionate about it with me, it's a lost cause before we've started. So actually, it's really important to get your staff together and go, what do we want this culture to look like? What for you can I do that will look after your well-being? What would you like? What will help? And then you can go through and go, okay, well, what kind of training is going to make a difference? So all my teachers are trained in yoga and meditation because they use it with the children, but also because they can use it themselves. We've had our governors trained as well through the Carnegie Center of Excellence so our governors know what they should be looking out for so that they can look after mental health within my staff as well, but also the mental health of the head teacher. Because on a day-to-day -day basis, there is nobody there to look after the mental health of senior leaders, but we are the most stressed group of people. So... All of these are examples of the kind of things that we provide and the things that we do. Um, even down to what you'll see the last one, the Spotlight Programme, we are now working with psychologists in my school. All of my teachers have, well, all of my staff now actually, all my teachers, admin, TAs, everything, have all been psychologically profiled. Oh. That was an interesting inset day. But it's really important because they know what are their stressors, what are their triggers. When you're stressed, what's your natural default in terms of how you behave? Now, I'm so, I, it won't come as a surprise to you. My natural behavior is forceful, apparently. It's true. I'm um, very goal oriented, very driven, very right. What are we trying to get to? But that's not a negative because in school sometimes you need that. But we need to be aware that actually there are lots of other styles and we need to learn to move between them. And that's self-efficacy and self-awareness. And why ultimately do I do all these things? I do all these things because of that. I don't want my school to be a paycheck. I want my staff to want to come to my school. I want my staff to pick me as the school in Leicester to come and work for rather than somebody else. And I can't do that if I don't look after my staff, I don't listen to them, and I don't support them. So that's why it's really important we're doing all of these things to try and make my staff feel valued, feel happy, feel that they can take risks and feel that the support is there whether they get it right or whether they get it wrong. Because that's actually what being a good person is about. It's not about being a good head, that's being a good person to the people I work with. So in terms of top tips to promote the culture, what's your culture going, what's your school going to look like if it's a happy place? Um, last year, we were runners-up in the Happy School Awards. We were only runners-up, though, which didn't make me happy. But, you know, runner-up in National Happiest Schools. But what does that look like again? Please, if anything, go away and try and make it your mission next week 
that you say something nice to everybody in your building. Even if it's just, I love that display, or did you have a lovely weekend? Um, because when we get to know our staff, we can help them more because we know what's going on in their lives. We know what they're struggling with. And actually being able to say to you, oh, how's the cat doing? Because I understand he got, he got stuck in a tree. Is he all right now? Actually makes such a difference to somebody. So make sure you're having all of these different ways, but remember tiny little things make a difference. You don't have to spend thousands of pounds. Little things make a difference, like a bar of chocolate, a handwritten thank you card, giving your staff a fudge Friday while you take the whole school assembly on your own and they go and make organic fudge for 20 minutes. They loved that one. Chocolate Friday was better though. And we need to remember this. In terms of stigma, we all have mental health, all of us. We all get in a bad mood, we all get stressed. In my school, we call it grumps. We all have our grump, we all have our blue days. So actually, let's be really open about that. As people, we get a grump on. But actually, how can we get that grump off when we have a grump on? And these are some of the things that we can do that by just being open and talking about mental health, like we talk about physical health, or art, or computing. See, literally, they are literally the things that are in the walls in my school. How do you get your grump off? Two minutes dance party, Mrs. Hill. You look like you've got a grump on, Mrs. Hill. Do you need a two minute dance party? Yes, I do. Self-awareness. If there is something to go away, and I know I've only got a couple of minutes, lady going, five minutes. I am a leader. I can give my staff the tools, the opportunity and the support to learn the skills you need to look after your mental health. But there's a really important word there, and that's your mental health. So you need to be looking after your mental health. I can't do it for you. I can support you. I can give you training. I can give you a counselor. I can give you supervision. We even run after school keep fit classes for staff. I can do all of those things, but you've got to use it as well. And that's really important that you actually say to your staff, you moan at your children about growing up and acting their age. You actually need to act like an adult as well and take responsibility for your own mental health. Come and tell me if you're struggling, but then what are we going to do about it? So they are, again, just some ideas. My staff get a duvet day. They get a day every year where if you know what, you just can't get out of bed or there's something really important you want to go and do, you get a day off and we cover the classes. The only stipulation is not the Monday or the Friday before or after a holiday, because I find children for that, so I'm not going to let teachers or TAs do that. Uh, learning library is actually just books. Books, magazines um, that you can have in your staff room, so people can actually start researching about mental health and well-being and resilience. We expect children to have breakfast when they come in, to be healthy, to be active. So why don't we encourage that in our teachers as well? So actually, do you have breakfast available for your staff in the staff room? Because we expect children to eat or they can't concentrate. Do we urge staff to take just mindful minutes, just go out for a short walk? Dragon breath if you're cross, as we talked about earlier so that you become more aware of what are your stressors, but also what can you do about it. And crucially in your school, if you are sitting there in, in charge of mental health and well-being, you've got to protect your staff, because you're the only person that's going to fight for them and actually fight to make well-being a crucial part of your school's agenda. Because I'm fairly confident if I didn't, we wouldn't be doing as much as we are now. So we have to protect our staff.
We have to give them enough time to do the job well. We have to make sure we're thinking about workload, the implications. What do the people need to do the best job that they can? And actually, do I know my staff well enough so I can go, oh, think there's a problem with that person? Oh, that person's not their cheery self. What can I do? Or everybody seems a bit antsy at the minute. I think we need to do something. And I started with 151 at the start, which was the number of days in an academic year that my staff took off due to mental health and well-being issues. By the following academic year, that was the number of days that staff had taken off for mental health and well-being issues. So the £22,000 I was spending on supply, I now have a budget for staff well-being with that £22,000 instead, because that's the impact of looking after the staff in our schools. Um, info there, um, I understand the slides are available afterwards. Um, I genuinely mean it when I say take my email if you want to get in touch. If you want to come and visit, please do. Um, I don't know if we've got any time for any questions. Really quick. I told you I like to talk. Your way on? Oh, yes. Um, what a fantastic measure of impact that is at the end. I feel I talked really fast. Ah, congratulations. We're, we're right there with you. Um, nobody has yet submitted a question on Slido. Clearly, which they means... were all yeah. so engaged yeah. in... Either you're just right there or we'll take some questions from the crowd. You said that you took psychologics, yeah. right, to evaluate your staff. Can you talk a little about it? How did you do it? Um, How long did it take for each uh, teacher? So we've only introduced it this year, so we've not really started it. We're working with two psychologists, and what it is, is it's a psychological profiling tool that helps our staff understand what is their natural preference for behavior. Are they naturally forceful? Are they naturally logical? Are they expressive or are they empathic? What's their, when you're, what do you naturally go to? And then what's your kind of mindset of how you approach things? Because when we understand more about ourselves, we can then understand what's the threat that going to be. So I'm forceful, but there are times I could be too forceful. So I need to actually learn in myself what are those situations where actually I need to not be my normal, natural state, and I need to try and be one of the others. Because the thing about stress and mental health is it can be very context-based. It can be this experience or that activity or that thing triggers that mental health, the anxiety, the stress. So if I can learn how to self-regulate better and I can learn which experience, which situation causes me that stress, I can actually pick which behavior and which mindset will help reduce that and for me to be more effective in my role. Um, it is going to be my master's dissertation, I've decided. It's never been used in a school before. So it's based on, if you do Google's Aristotle, uh, it's actually based on a project that's been in private businesses and FTSE 100 companies, but it's not been done in school before. Um, so I want to see if all of that kind of research from the business sector, where they do use psychological profiling to improve team performance, self-performance, well, actually, can we do that with our staff? And there is research that suggests, actually, self-efficacy, emotional intelligence, not only improves mental health, um, but actually improves you in the classroom as well. Oh, thank you so much, Kerry. We're out of time.